Conley is the engineer, water guy for Pacific Corps. He's been with them, how long has it been, Com? Going on uh, nine years. Nine years? Holy smokes. Years. Matter of fact, I think it was the Eight. Eco Symposium was the um, first time we, we met Conley. He's been a, a, a great partner and, and a good guy to work with, so appreciate him. The schedule has a break before my talk. But we'll just go ahead. No food, so okay. <laughs> One of the uh, topics of my presentation is history, um, which has a quite a, a range of uh, topics there, kind of a wide time scale. So I'll, one of the topics is uh, 2011. Uh, we could be making history this year. Um, and before I'll, and so, just to kind of set the start context, that last fall in November we were about 59.10. We were just a couple of hundreds of a foot less than that, so we're using, so that's where we were. And in all of this history, this is a, a plot of the lake levels um, back to, to 1915. This is just the max and the min every year. Um, typically the minimum in irrigation years is in the fall before we start refilling a lake. And in uh, years when we're use, releasing water during the winter for flood control, the minimum usually occurs m about March 31st, just before runoff starts. And then peaks um, anywhere from May 15th in, drought, in uh, wetter, uh, drier years rather, through um, um, even middle, of to middle to late July in very wet years. So that's what this is plotting. And in all of the observed years, you'll notice some of these years when we're kind of bouncing at the top, we make uh, winter releases to uh, provide flood control storage for the following runoff season. So there, there is um, water that you know, the lake if we start here, if it was a very wet year, the lake would have gone um, quite high. So uh, there's a, that extra water. But in the observed, from the observed minimum to the maximum, from um, the fall or early spring to the next year, the highest the lake has ever risen is 7.7 .7 feet. So that's the ma largest observed rise we've ever seen. Um, with the a natural flow that we have, if you'd kind of take the top off the lake and, and drown Garden City and Lake Town and, and just see how well high the lake could have gone in a year when we started out right here in the 1980s. In 1986, if the lake would have been down at 5902, it would have risen to 5918.2 in one year if, we, if the lake would have been down that low. Typically, we have wet years before that where the lake is already pretty high. But this year, we're in a very unique situation where uh, we started pretty low, about 30% full in terms of volume, down at 59.10. And with the forecast that we have, uh, just using basically the, the water supply forecast from the government, plus adding just a little bit that the uh, direct runoff from the Bear Lake watershed provides, we're forecast to get up to 59.21.1, which is 11.1 .1 feet. And if that actually happens, and I still have to kind of pinch myself every day and rerun the numbers every, every uh, week or so to see can we actually get the lake up 11.1 .1 feet in one runoff season. So uh, you, you'll all be able to see that this year and we might have uh, history in the making to have an actual observed rise. In terms of the volume of water, it's still a whole heck of a lot, but uh, it's, it's still kind of an upper 20 percentile in terms of the actual volume. So the volumes aren't really super extreme. I mean, they're in the top 20 percent, which is extreme. But to be able to see the lake come up that much um, kind of boggles the mind. And this is the shoreline conference. So I ran the numbers on the, the, the area. And from, from 59.10 up to 21.1, that would indicate 9.25 square miles of, of land that's in between that, so 5,200 acres. So that is, that is a whole heck of a lot. So we could, uh, could see history in the making this year. What's, what's the uh, range <coughs> for your estimate? How much higher could it go or how much lower? Yeah, using kind of the, the water supply forecasts, um, it's, it's getting fairly narrow. I can't remember if it was 20, I'd have to look at the numbers again. It wasn't much more like 22 and a half. And then um, down to like 19. I should have I should have those in memory, but I've been 
looking at lots of different numbers for my presentation. But yeah, it's about a, a foot above, foot below. Foot below. So well, when I first started with the company, um, the, my boss in Oregon said that people in Oregon, unless you actually have the professional engineer's license, you can't call yourself an engineer. So I've, since then, I've been branded a hydrologist, which is just fine since my master's was in kind of hydrologic engineering. So um, I'm an engineer, but I can go by hydrologist too. Um, and I have been at Pacific Water for eight years, and I'm in charge of uh, water management, high runoff, um, interaction with the irrigation groups, and uh, recently uh, also uh, scheduling the, the power on the Bear River and in other areas of the company as well. So I'm experimenting with um, a new way to present this, and it's a little bit slow on this machine. We saw the computer choking on the video. It's uh, choking a little bit on my presentation as well, but luckily we got a little bit of it out of the way already. So <laughs> I was going to reboot it during the break, but sometimes that helps too. So my, the title of my talk is Bear Lake at Work. Um, and I use that weird, funny little symbol at the end of uh, the title just because we're going to have go through some uh, some numbers as well as uh, as we go through the go through the talk. So we're going to start with a little bit of context. Um, as you can see, I'm going to talk about the context as well as the uh, uh, work that the, Bear, the lake does, as well as some of the uh, history. So you can see some of that uh, that, I'll be, that I'll be doing there. So the first part of the context is the law of the lake. Uh, we often hear about law of the river, but since uh, the uh, it's, uh, it's a lake and not a river. We'll, we'll use the, the law of the lake. And there are two parts of the law of the lake, the what, which is the, uh, the actual document. But in terms of this, this audience, I don't think we quite care what the name of each of those pieces of um, uh, legal, legalese are. But we care about what that, happen, what that does to uh, the lake and what it, with the actual impact. So it's the so what, the what and the so what. Okay, so the one on the left, the so what on the right. Um, in the 1890s um, was the first uh, set of federal laws that were actually general that um, looked forward towards the development of, uh, of both land and, and area for public purposes. Um, and the later documents that were specific to Bear Lake in 1907 very clearly set the priorities to irrigation, flood control, and hydroelectric generation. And so even back as, as early as the very beginning, that's been kind of the, the, the motivating reasons for the development. Um, and it was initially developed by an uh, irrigation company, but in 1912, uh, that's when the, the, the power company, at that time uh, Utah Power and Light, was uh, signed an agreement with the uh, Box Elder County uh, Irrigation Company to basically swap. We would take and develop Bear Lake, and they would, we would deliver to them 900 cubic feet per second of water, which is a flow rate of water, to Box Elder County, which would irrigate about 65,000 acres of land in Box Elder County, which is um, down near the, near the bottom end of the system. Uh, in the 1920s, there were some water right decrees that came into place that governed the uh, water and gave each entity uh, their portion of the water rights and for the amount of water that could be diverted from the Bear River to be put into Bear Lake, that was 5,500 CFS. And the forecast is to uh, actually get right at that amount this, this spring and at the peak um, at Stewart Dam where the water is diverted into uh, Mud Lake and then Bear Lake. In 1955, uh, there was a, a Bear River Compact. Since the Bear River flows through three states, the compact um, between Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah laid some ground rules, and Bear Lake was among them. The key parts, key parts is that there was an irrigation reserve set. Um, in the early 1920s, soon after lift and pumping plant was finished, um, the power company did for about three years there um, uh, release uh, a little more water uh, for downstream power generation than 
um, the irrigators would have liked. So 5914.7, which is um, just a little over about nine feet below the uh, full mark, they set that that anywhere below there, releases could only be made for irrigation. Uh, and also, on the flip side, to protect Bear Lake uh, and our interests, uh, at 5911, if the lake is below 5911, the uh, upstream storage, primarily in uh, Wyoming, they were limited to the amount of storage they had in place at the time of the compact. And so that, uh, that provided a buffer for, they could build more reservoirs in the future after that point in time, but that Bear Lake would not suffer because of that. And the, and the power company was very interested that those um, those um, uh, conditions be in, in place. In uh, 1975 and 1980, there were uh, lawsuits that uh, landowners made claims against Pacific Corp, uh, which was the, the name, current name of the company. It, was, it used to be Utah Power and Light, but that's the, the, uh, the name of the company now. And uh, on your power bills, you'll see Rocky Mountain Power. That's the, the uh, public face of Pacific Corp. And so those lawsuits were contending that the, the lake uh, and the other reservoirs weren't operated uh, to protect uh, adequately their, their land. And so uh, we, uh, we won, won, won one, lost one, but the end result was that uh, it, it just made, made us aware as a, as a company that the flooding is a serious issue. Um, and so we, uh, we take that uh, very seriously, and we'll talk a little more about that later on. 1995. Um, we had, before that point, we made, the, uh, the company regularly made uh, trips to dredge the, on the Bear Lake side, uh, a channel between Lifton and out into the open water, since the, the, the land does get fairly shallow there and there was uh, quite a bit of redistribution of sediment. And so just, you, and uh, it, from the records, they did it uh, on a, a pretty frequent basis. It looks like it wasn't always needed, but it was kind of a um, feel good for the managers to have that done. So in 1995, kind of on a regular um, update um, to that, to getting that permit, there was a lawsuit filed, um, and so as a result of settling that, the uh, irrigation supply uh, was rationed. So uh, that was primarily from um, uh, groups around, homeowners around the lake and others that wanted to see, um, uh, did not want to see the lake uh, lowered any faster or any more than it um, needed to be. And so since that time, that has been in place. And I'll actually talk a little more about that um, as well. It's an important um, change to the operation of the lake since that time. Um, and I didn't put it on here, but in 2004, that agreement was um, updated just to make uh, a few minor changes that didn't really change uh, much. In 1999 and 2000, uh, Pacific Corp was acquired by a foreign company, Scottish Power. And so at that time, the three states got kind of nervous that the, the, the things would change, the operation would change dramatically. Um, and so they uh, signed these, the three-state agreement, basically to maintain historic practices. So stick to it. So whatever the, 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 uh, the operating regime was, make sure you maintain that. And it's also interesting, the three-state agreement kind of laid out in, in fairly good detail our approach for flood control using Bear Lake. Um, and so that made that fairly, uh, fairly transparent. And uh, so it's... Uh, it's kind of set the, set the stage. And when uh, Pacific Corp was subsequently acquired by Mid-American Energy, Energy Holdings Company, that was uh, a renewed, uh, that same agreement was just uh, put into the uh, agreements for that so that that um, is just uh, uh, mentioned and honored in the future. So the next bit of context, um, after we go through this, The next bit of context is just the plumbing of the lake, which um, I suspect most everybody is um, familiar with, but uh, we'll, we'll go through this. Is anybody, uh, I don't know which way to ask this question, who, who's, uh, I can, yeah, either way I ask it, it won't really help me, so we'll just go through it. Um, as you see, the Bear River is, uh, is, diverted at, uh, at the Stewart Dam. There was an old canal, the Dingle Inlet Canal was the very first one um, that was uh, dug in uh, 1911. Um, was had too high of a, of a slope and so it did not uh, function very well. So they built a, a small diversion dam 
here on the Bear River in diverse water. And this is the Rainbow Inlet Canal uh, control structure. And then the canal continues on into Mud Lake. And then there's a causeway structure to allow water into Bear Lake and then the lift and pumps. And then there was also a, a dike and some gates built on the north end of Mud Lake. Um, and the, the previous old natural outlet channel was kind of dug in a straight line. And, and so these control structures here provide um, control for water leaving. And this is the old Bear River channel here. And so I'll just go through a few different configurations of, of that. So you can see here the, the rainbow uh, canal uh, control gates are open in my little diagram there. Water flows into Mud Lake and thence into Bear Lake. And so that's um, it's spring conditions and the winter conditions in uh, dry years when we're filling like all winter long. The next is kind of a spring-summer transition period where there's water needed downstream for irrigation, but um, it's not enough, but there's enough incoming supply to just pass that downstream. And so both the rainbow canal gates are open and the outlet canal gates are open. You see there's no uh, movement of water between Mud Lake and Bear Lake. And that's done just primarily for um, ease of measuring the water. Um, it could naturally just as easily be passed down the old channel, but um, it's uh, in terms of um, our measurement structures and for continuity for the transition between natural flow and providing irrigation water from Bear Lake, it's easier to, to pass it through Mud Lake. Then in the summer, delivering uh, Bear Lake storage, uh, there's little or no flow in the rainbow at that point in time, even though the gates are usually um, left open to catch any remaining uh, water supply that's not used for irrigation upstream. And we pump water from Bear Lake into Mud Lake and then out to the outlet canal and down to irrigators downstream. And there's this very small um, detail. Sometimes we equalize between Mud Lake and Bear Lake where we're pumping when both the, rain, when the, the outlet canal gates are closed. And that's uh, fairly rare, but it does occur. So a little bit on the history. Um, it, as I mentioned, about 100, 100 years ago in 1911, I found a, a water uh, measuring booklet where they had handwritten notes and actually had a 100-year-old squished mosquito in there <laughs> that uh, recorded that when they first put water in the Dingle uh, Canal and put, started putting a little bit of water in, in Bear Lake. At that point, it just went into the wetland and the nat old natural outlet um, had the water flow back into uh, Bear Lake through that natural outlet. And so now we're in 2011. Um, and so it's, we're kind of at a, the 100 year uh, point from that. And uh, the, when the European settlers got here, there was no obvious direct connection between Bear River and Bear Lake. Um, and that's kind of a perennial question. And luckily, the uh, U US Geological Survey um, came and did a, a, an extensive evaluation of Bear Lake in terms of trying to evaluate the lake level and climate using, they would co they cord into the sediment to try to relate climate to um, to those sediments to try to get a uh, uh, his look into the uh, long-term climate changes. But because of the, the complex chemical changes in the lake, the uh, carbonates and, and all of those chemicals, it was get confounded that signature. But we did get a lot of uh, very interesting information from that. And one was um, this, this little uh, graph that shows the black is the time when the Bear River was connected to Bear Lake uh, through various geological mechanisms. And then the white spots are where uh, the Bear River was not connected to Bear Lake. And so five-sixths of the time um, of the past 240, 50,000 years, Bear River was connected to Bear Lake and did flow into Bear Lake. And, uh, and so the more recent uh, 20,000 years or so uh, when it wasn't connected is actually um, fairly rare from a geologic standpoint. They had a couple of different configurations. Um, the upper left um, is where the Bear River just kind of flows uh, directly north and uh, completely bypassed the lake. A couple of other open basin configurations, or three of them, in the upper right is kind of an ice age configuration where the, the volume of water was very, um, very high. And also, I don't know the, the gory details, but various is the, is the shift, is the plate shifted, and is the fault shifted, that also changed kind of the, the, uh, the ground state as well. 
So we have that one, and then in uh, C, where the water did flow directly in. And in some of the research they showed, they actually identified the old channels um, of how Bear River came into Bear Lake. And one of them was, did actually follow that old, that very first channel of the Dingle Inlet Canal, which kind of, as it comes out of the mountain, it just turns a corner and cuts kind of right at the north end of the base of the foothills there and came into, into the wetlands in Bear Lake at that point. And then D is kind of a, uh, what it looks like today, but also um, uh, prehistorically, the wetlands functioned and functioned and uh, mediated the water inflow into Bear Lake. So that's basically what we're mimicking today is that configuration where water from Bear River flows into the wetlands and then into Bear Lake. So we've already talked about this. Um, I have a small graph here on the history of the singular lake rise. So if you take all of the, the changes from the min to the max and just line them up um, yeah, sort them in order. We have kind of very low up to 7.7 .7 feet that I mentioned. And then this year is that gray line there. So if that happens, it will be history in the making. It will, it will be history. So in terms of irrigating, a 2002 uh, st uh, study reported that the crop production from uh, lands irrigated by the Bear River and also from uh, supplement by water from Bear Lake was resulted in $45 million a year in crop production, which is an amazing annual number to think about. And it irrigates 150,000 acre feet, which is 3,235 square miles of land that's supplemented. And in drier years, it, it can form a, a pretty good percentage of the water supply for that, for that area. But I mentioned the irrigation uh, rationing. And so there's this graph, um, the colored area shows the irrigation deficit. So if you have the, the natural supply that they would need to irrigate all that land, and then uh, based on the water level, that's what determines the rationing. So the, that shows the difference. The natural supply is along the bottom um, in thousands of acre feet um, of, uh, of net runoff, which is available from the, both the Bear River and Bear Lake. And then the spring maximum elevation on the left. So there's no restrictions above 5914.7, and then below 5904 there's no, uh, no allocation made. And so the years, 2000 in the upper, upper left, and then uh, 2001 follows through the whole decade, and then on into 2011. You'll notice uh, two recent years, 2003 and 2004, where we did actually have a, a water supply deficit. And so since they knew, the irrigators knew that we would have that in the spring, they knew of the the amount of allocation and the approximate amount of natural supply. Um, they made, uh, went to severe measures to, to restrict land that was irrigated and use all of the other uh, mechanisms to cope with that. Um, but since then, we haven't really had the, the natural supply has been adequate to, to uh, provide water for, the, um, for irrigation. The other one I mentioned was uh, protecting from downstream areas from flooding. And so this is what Grace Dam looked like uh, a little while ago. We're not spilling right now, but it was spilling. Grace was about um, uh, th a day and a half on the water to get there. And then Gentile Valley down below, which is an old, uh, old lake bed that um, gets inundated. And this is at 1,500 CFS in the river. And at that point, 2,100 CFS was being diverted into Bear Lake. So you can imagine what that area would look like if there was 3,600 CFS flowing through there. So the top uh, five, four and a half feet of Bear Lake is used for uh, flood control. That's 395,000 acre feet, which is two times the volume of Willard Bay is for those of you that came from the Salt Lake area and drove past Willard Bay. And that's Willard Bay when it's full. Um, and so 1986, I mentioned that uh, in before that that was the 16.6 foot natural rise and 21.1 is the forecasted this spring. And so we, we may actually have, uh, make flood control releases this winter, depending on if we do actually get up to 5921.1. So this graph looks busy, but if you take uh, the continuous lake levels, not just the max and min, from April 1 on the left through the, to the April 1 of the next year on the right, the, the lines are the water level, and the, the shaded areas 
um, indicate the uh, uh, magnitude of pumping from Bear Lake. So in the spring, we're storing water for, for uh, irrigation, for flood control or, and or irrigation. Then in this region, this hatched area, that's where we're making water releases um, during the winter for flood control. Down here, this is all just irrigation storage releases that we're storing all winter long. And so if we, our spring maximum is kind of getting into that region where we may need to make winter uh, flood control releases. And so, since Bear Lake does uh, so much work for the company, we thought we'd, uh, I thought I made him a, a, a badge. So, uh, Pacific Corp, Bear Lake is, is at work um, for Pacific Corp and for the irrigators as well. And yeah, thank you very much. No, no. <laughs> Actually, the, the lake will probably not peak until probably mid-July, if, if not end July. Um, so that it could be a while there. Be in, in flow, clear in yep, yep. And uh, I just I rely on the weather service for uh, the the river forecast flows, and it's not in the next ten days. That's all I care right now. So. Yeah, the, the River Forecast Center is put, putting the, kind of the, the middle of the road at 5,500, which is why we put out a press release about uh, a couple of weeks ago to warn the people below Stewart Dam that um, yeah, there's no reservoir behind there, and if it goes above 5,000, then that extra amount will, will have to pass below Stewart Dam. So we've been in contact with, with those folks and e actually mailed them our press release directly. Um, it's pretty close to 5,000. We might need to bring Mud Lake up to make that happen. But we also have the Sluice Way at, at the lift and pumping plant, so we'll have adequate capacity to get into the lake, whatever we can get in the canal, so. When do you make your decision to winter pump on the lake? And how do you, <coughs> I don't mean technically, but how do you do that since you don't know what's going to happen in the summer? Yeah, we make the decision in the fall. Um, after the summer, and then and it's... How, how do you do that? I mean, you don't really know how much snowfall we're going to get in the winter. Yeah, we have a default spring level down to 59.18. So if we're above 59.18 in the fall, uh, then we release water so that by March 31st we're at 59.18. And that's the default. If we know, and on January 1st we get a pretty good estimate of the runoff, so we, we make, take our best guess in the fall and release and target 59.18. I didn't emphasize that in the graph, but um, we have that, that's that last little bit is, the, is the, the target. It can range from 59.16. So here's the low. 59.16 is if we really expect it to be a gangbuster year, we try to pump right down to that level. If we know, and come January 1st, if it's turning um, a tour into a drought, runoff, then we can target 5920, which is a little bit less of flood control storage, but the middle of the range is 5918, and so that's kind of our default where we just plan, and the winter inflows are fairly stable, so we know how much is coming in over the winter usually, and the real, the real wild card starts April 1st when we have the snow melt start. So that's why we, in the fall we default to 5918 and uh, as a target for the next March 31st. Yeah. Uh, or do you have somebody projecting the weather and what's going to be? No, the 1518, uh, I haven't looked into that, but I think it was a combination of historical experience and some uh, guru thrown in. But that's what, that's what was specified in the, the settlement agreement, the, not no, no, the three state agreement, the 1999, oh, okay. 2000. No, that was the, the merger agreement that said stick to it. So that was decided before then, and so that was kind of our operating procedure that was in place and has uh, served us adequately in kind of a balance, frankly, between uh, keeping irrigation whole and the lake level high with protecting downstream uh, lands from minimizing flooding downstream. So that's kind of it strikes that balance.
coming in that water or sediment. And if it was found that, I guess, the, there was too much sediment or it was undesirable, could something more be done at that inlet to more filter that water or have less sediment? I guess the two questions, have there been any studies? And second of all, could something more be done there? Yeah, there have been studies, and actually back as, as far back as 1986, there was a study just before that that um, looked at using the cosmic structure. Historically, actually before 1986, um, it was all of the water came in the Rainbow Canal and then actually flowed, uh, since it's in a wetland area, flowed backwards up the outlet canal and there were sluice gates at Lifton where they just opened to let the water go in that way. They had done some studies and found that using the causeway, it let that water flow through the wetland area and deposit some of the fine sediments and go in that way. So that's the way we've been operating since 1986, is whenever water goes into the lake, it goes through Mud Lake and then through the causeway instead of kind of short-circuiting through the, the canals that were dredged through the wetland area. And there's always ongoing um, studies and evaluations, um, and, and so that to improve things. And uh, the Mud Lake side, there was uh, has been a couple of uh, not studies, but ideas on ways that could improve uh, that, uh, yeah, reduce the amount of sediment even further. And uh, has and actually recent studies as well. Utah State um, did a, a more recent study, kind of updating the '86. Uh, st study, and so that uh, is going to inform any future um, decisions that are or changes that are made on that side. I don't know if we have any time for more Kay, questions. One, one more. Yeah, you're not going to solve it. I mean, it's always going to have um, have sediment in there, but just in terms of trying to reduce that. Um, but but and, and there is a lot of concern in, in the lake, and it does it isn't uh, pretty, but it does provide a little bit of input in this oligotrophic lake to provide a little bit of, of support for the fish. And um, and his prehistorically, that condition has been observed. So. Um, at least from, from that uh, perspective, that type of, of situation isn't uh, unheard of in terms of um, the ecology of the lake. So it, it knows how to, how to deal with that somewhat. What's the current level of the lake right now? Uh, 59.14.5 in round numbers. Oh yeah, the high water mark is 59.23.65. That's this solid up here, and that's the highest it's ever been. Um, and and uh, a snow snowtail forecaster, he was saying the lake could fill this year, and I don't know if it'll quite get up to full my full, which is 23.65. But um, I think anything above 59.18 is kind of in the normal pool. So I think that from that definition, I think we most definitely will get above 59.18. Well, most most pe most of the surveyors actually use the UPNL datum here, so it should be the same. But uh, if I go to any other benchmark, it is what is it? One point four feet, or is it? Twenty six. Twenty six. Oh, I've got that slide. You've got slide. All right. Okay, we got we got that. But okay. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>